Don't worry, there's no need to skip ahead. If you're new or just coming in from PS5, this entire channel is dedicated to straightforward Sea of Thieves tips with next to no fluff. This video condenses my entire 50 episode long tips playlist into a single need to know video. That being said, if you want deeper knowledge on any topic, check the playlist in the description. If you're playing with friends, do yourself a favor and just direct them to this very video. That way you don't have to waste your time explaining all this stuff, especially the important bits towards the end, to Jeff. Get it together, Jeff, come on. I'll quickly just ask you to consider subscribing so I can finally get my 100K plaque and the validation I so desperately need. Okay, sorry, let's just jump into the guide. First things first, I'm gonna be brutally honest here. The game is permanently in various states of bugginess and latency. I'm not trying to scare you off. Sea of Thieves still remains one of, if not the best multiplayer experience in the last decade. So when you do start the game, you'll be asked to pick a character. Take as long as you'd like, just know that all hitboxes are exactly the same, and the only downside to a bigger pirate is you might stick out a bit more when hiding on enemy ships. But I say live your life, just pick your favorite. After that, you'll be tossed into the game world. From now on, when booting up, you'll have to pick between Safer Seas, which has PvP disabled and is just you and your crew, no one else, or High Seas, which is the full game. In exchange for privacy, Safer Seas offers a significantly watered down version of the game. Feel free to pause here for the full list. While High Seas sounds scary, I suggest just jumping right in. You're going to sink, get in fights you don't want, and lose a lot, but it's nothing to feel bad about. That's just how you get better at the game, little by little, piece by piece. Staying in safer seas just allows bad habits to form, which will make it harder to defend from other players when the time comes. Moving on to ship types. The sloop is best for one to two players, brig is for three, and galleon is for four. I really don't recommend using a bigger ship unless you have the crew for it, you can try Open Crew, the game's public matchmaking service, but it's very hit or miss with the quality of players you meet. It's best to have your own crew or join the various discords around the game to find one. Mine's in the description, by the way. If that's not for you, you can totally play solo. It is generally considered the hardest way to play the game, but you'll definitely learn fast from your mistakes. Let's talk settings. The very first thing that you have to change is your FOV. Set it to 90 or you won't be able to see a thing. Your most important keybind is for food. Then, if possible, add keybinds for planks and your bucket. If on controller, you'll want to set your sensitivity as high as you're comfortable with. You also don't want to have to take your hands off of the analog sticks when jumping, so rebind jump to one of your bumpers and food to X A. Before leaving the outpost, you need to make sure you gather supplies from barrels laying around. This will ensure you're supplied up with cannons, planks, and fruit. Fruit heals different amounts of health. From highest to lowest, it's pineapples, mangoes, pomegranates, coconuts, and then bananas. You can cook fish and meat on the stove in your ship, which will also heal you and provide overheal, which heals missing health over time. You can switch between all your food by hitting your food keybind multiple times. If you have spare gold, you can buy supplies straight from the merchant on the dock or even just a storage crate that makes gathering supplies infinitely faster. If you own your own ship, which we'll talk about later, you can also buy supplies from the shipwright. Once you've set sail, the number one rule is do not anchor your ship unless you're trying to do an anchor turn, and even then raise it back up immediately. If you need to stop somewhere, just raise your sails all the way up ahead of time and slowly come to a stop. This way you won't be stuck if an enemy ship pulls up on you. Make sure your sails are always maintained properly. Always turn the sails to catch the wind as best they can, unless you're going directly head on into the wind. In that case, you'll want the sails facing straight forward. It doesn't really make any sense, but that's just how the game works. The one outlier is the sloop, which should always have the sails facing straight forward if it can't catch the wind at full billow. You can use the harpoons at the front of your ship to quickly harpoon loot, other players and new in season 12, you can actually balance and run across them. Now that we've covered the basics, I'm going to lightly touch on the PVE side of the game, which while massive is mostly at its core, just fighting skeletons. The more narrative content can be found in the tall tales. These are the story missions of Sea of Thieves, which are broken up into multiple campaigns, including the Pirates of the Caribbean missions and the Monkey Island series. These are quite fun, so I definitely recommend picking up some friends to run through them at least one time around. 
Now back to Smashing Skeletons, your captain's table is your central hub for all things PvE. This is where you'll decide which quest to go on and how to get there. You can take the immersive route and just sail yourself, or you can choose to dive and fast travel directly to your destination. You can even dive to world events after you level up in various factions. Be warned, however, if you try and fast travel with loot on your ship, you'll lose all of it. Speaking of world events, there are missions marked by various clouds and tornadoes in the sky accessible by everyone on the server. But if you're looking for a more relaxed event for a quick play session, consider looting sea forts around the map. Okay, so you've got some loot, now what? Well, each type of loot belongs to a certain faction found on every outpost. The majority of factions are capped at level 100, but you can prestige, called distinctions in this game, up to a total of five times per faction, earning unique rings with each go around. Hitting level 50 in three factions will earn you the coveted pirate legend status. It doesn't change the gameplay loop all that much, but you will get some very cool cosmetics and some PL specific quests. A great way to make the grind to 100 much easier is by flying an emissary flag. These are purchased with a one-time fee for each faction at level 15. Once you vote to raise this flag, you increase its grade by collecting loot belonging to that faction. With each grade increase, you earn a higher multiplier for gold and rep earned for that trading company, capping out at a 2.5 times multiplier at grade five. Now, if your ship sinks, However, you will lose your flag and will have to start over. The number of little toy ships on emissary tables will show you the number of crews in that server using that flag, which can be a good way to gauge server activity. The number one mistake that new players make involves the emissary system, but we'll come back to that later in the video, so stay tuned. Your first major goal in Sea of Thieves should be owning your own ship. This is called captaincy and costs hundreds of thousands of gold depending on the ship type. This will allow you to name your ship buy extra supplies, and most importantly, turn in all of your loot, no matter the faction, at the Sovereign Tower on each outpost. A recent addition to captaincy is guilds. If you do own your own ship, you can use it to create a guild, which you can then invite other pirates to in order to share your ships and earn rare cosmetics. Don't forget, if you hit rank five with a guild emissary, you will be marked on the map for all players. Okay, we've made it to the most important part of the video. Without a single doubt, the most valuable knowledge in Sea of Thieves is game sense, mechanics, and PvP know-how. It doesn't matter if you don't plan on attacking other players, as long as you're sailing outside of safer seas, PvP will find you. And the following knowledge will save your life and your loot, so pay attention. But most of all, remember the golden rule of Sea of Thieves. Loot isn't yours until you've turned it in. It will get stolen, you will sink, but there's always more out there, so don't sweat it. Let's start with weapons. Now, in Season 12, there's a total of six weapons to choose from, with blow darts and a grappling hook coming in Season 14 at the end of this year. I recommend new players start with sword and the double barrel pistol, or sword and blunderbuss. First, the normal pistol is an all-around good choice for most situations. The motto for the sword is easy to learn and hard to master, as it has a lot of hidden tech involved to get really good with it. We'll get into that in a minute, but it's a good option for close quarters combat and defending your ship. As is the blunderbuss, which at point blank range can one-shot other players, but if you're fighting in the water, it's pretty useless at range. The Eye of Reach is obviously good at long range, but more importantly, it's typically used with the blunderbuss to quickly two-tap players with successive shots. This is called double gunning and is generally considered the sweaty way to play Sea of Thieves. The sniper does deal 70% damage, so make absolutely sure you are always above 70% health or you'll be killable in a single hit. No, really, always be sure to heal. Next, the double barrel pistol lets you shoot two shots before reloading or you can charge both for more damage. It has a shorter range than the normal pistol, but it does have a faster fire rate. Think of it as the middle ground between the pistol and the blunderbuss. The extra shot paired with the sword makes it good for players who aren't yet confident with their aim in PvP. The throwing knives are all about stealth and style. You can use them to shank for low damage, stab for high damage, but you can also throw them as a ranged weapon. If you miss, they can be picked back up from the world by any player with any loadout, not just you. 
circling back to the sword, it attacks in a three-hit combo. So if you're being attacked, you can block all of these hits, and after their combo ends, it is then your turn to start swinging and start your combo. Unfortunately, this can be pretty buggy because you can actually have your combo interrupted by the other player if there's too much lag. Now, if you hold block and jump in any direction, you'll do a sword hop, which will allow you to actually phase through other players to get behind them. You can also use this while running to keep your movement erratic and avoid getting shot. If you hold down the attack button, you can do a sword lunge for high damage, but if you miss the enemy, you will become stunned. Lastly, the most important move with the sword is the lunge jump. If you hold block while activating your lunge, it'll allow you to not only move faster, but jump during the lunge. You have to hit jump right when you hear the lunge noise start, and that will let you travel much faster into water and jump bigger gaps. There's a couple tools you can find just around the world. New in Season 12 is the Wind Caller, and this thing has a ton of uses. It can blow wind into your sails, knock players away, propel yourself in water, turn a rowboat into a jet ski, put out fires quickly, and even prevent fall damage. When shooting cannonballs, use each shot to line up your next one. It sounds obvious, but make sure you pay attention to where each shot lands and then readjust accordingly. Try to hit the lower decks of an enemy ship to make them take on more water. You can also aim for the enemy cannon to prevent them from shooting back. Or if you're close enough, harpoon them from their cannon over to your ship so you can fight them. There are also different types of cannonballs, namely chain shots, scatter shots, and cursed cannonballs. Chain shots can break parts of an enemy ship and are actually heavier, so they need to be aimed slightly higher than normal cannonballs. Mostly you'll want to use these to knock down an enemy mass so they can't move. This is how you're going to want to open most fights. It's worth noting that all mass fall down after just one shot except sloops, which take two shots. Ship parts can also be damaged by normal cannonballs, but less efficiently. Scatter shots shoot multiple tiny projectiles at an extremely short range. The purpose of these is to create mini tier 1 holes to eat up enemy resources and create pressure. Now, curse balls apply various special effects to enemies, green affecting players and purple affecting ships. These can be used at opportune moments to change the tide of a battle. Blunderbombs, firebombs, and the bone callers are special. They can be used by hand or by cannon. Firebombs are good for burning bigger ships like galleons, especially when they're immobilized. Now, using a bone caller will summon a skeleton crew to fight by your side or on an enemy ship if you shoot it via cannon. These can help relieve pressure in a fight by creating a distraction, and you can even summon your own skeleton crew to fight a rival's bone caller. Blunder bombs are one of the best weapons in the game. They can be used to keep enemies away, do major damage in water, or even prevent people from fixing their ship. So when steering, you always want to have your cannons aimed at the enemy ship without them being able to aim at you. Typically, your goal is to circle behind and around them as you shoot. If they're immobilized, you'll want to do what's called a death spiral and circle around their boat laying down heavy damage. To make a perfect circle, you'll usually want to match the percent you've spun the wheel with the percent you raise the sails. So if the wheel is half turned, raise sails by half, etc. Don't forget to keep your ship repaired and bucket water out. Be sure to repair lower holes first. The holes in your ship can be tier one, tier two, or tier three, which will not only change the size of the hole, phrasing, but also the amount of water coming in. So you wanna be sure to prioritize repairing higher tiers first. A difficult thing for newer players is learning when to prioritize repairing versus attacking. And it's all about pressure. Pressure is what keeps you alive. If the enemy has no holes on their ship, you need to hit at least one or two so they can't afford to send someone over to board you. So if your water level isn't too high, you might want to take a couple shots before you start repairing. If your ship is seconds away from sinking, you'll hear a heavy death groan. You'll also want to protect yourself from boarders. When someone tries to board you, you'll hear a number of sound cues. They might shoot themselves out of a cannon, which will make a whistling sound. Then you'll hear a mermaid pop up. The sound of swimming. And then most importantly, a telltale splash when they grab your ladder. You'll need to listen for this noise at all times. If someone is boarding your ship, you can either chop them off the ladder with your sword, blunderbuss them right as their climbing animation ends, or blunderbomb them off. 
Speaking of mermaids, not only do they bring you back to your ship, but they completely give away your position if you're trying to be stealthy. They only show up when you're far away from your ship. So if you're close by and you see a mermaid, that could mean there's a player sneaking about near you. The strategy to sink an enemy ship is this. Immobilize them either by anchoring or knocking their mast down, shoot lower holes, shoot yourself over and board their ship, then camp them until their boat sinks. If that sounds a bit too intimidating for a new player, that's totally fine. You can come ask me questions or just watch me PvP every weekday at twitch.tv slash blurbs. And for you new PS5 players, I regularly have exclusive giveaways and Twitch drops for unique Sea of Thieves cosmetics you can only get on Twitch. Now, where was I? Another quick tip, do not put kegs on your ship. I know they can be fun to use, but even if they're in the crow's nest, any decent player will see them and either shoot them or blow them up before you can even get close to them. Have you noticed this cute little hourglass on your captain's table? That's the PvP matchmaking mode, which is significantly more difficult than fighting randoms across the sea. It's supposed to match you based on skill, but there isn't always enough players queued, so you often will be mismatched with mega sweats. However, this mode is how you acquire arguably the coolest cosmetics in the game, the Athena Blessing and Skeleton Curse. You must reach rank 100 in the respective faction to earn these. Now, remember when I said earlier one of the biggest mistakes a new player can make involves the emissary system? While you should definitely give emissaries a try, they make you a target for PvPers and the Reaper faction. The Reaper emissary flag ranks up by collecting loot from all factions, and once at rank 5, the Reaper emissary can see all other emissaries on the map in real time in order to hunt them down. Don't worry though, Reapers are always marked on the map at all times, so keep a close eye on any around you and if they are headed your way. It's slightly confusing, but there's also Reaper chests, high value items marked on the map at all times, and the Reaper's mark. The Reaper's mark is the super cool looking red flag in your flag box that will mark you for PvP anywhere you go. Funnily enough, it's strictly used by new players who don't know what it does. You can get the free hide emote in the Emporium above the purple Order of Souls tent. Under the Pirate tab, find the Hide and Sneak bundle and it should be in there. This emote lets you curl up into a little ball, but more importantly hides your nameplate from other players, letting you stow away on their ships. You may have noticed this glowing scroll on your mast, and this is the Skull of Siren Song. If you activate this, you'll be placed in a server-wide shared voyage to bring Briggsy a skull that she needs for, I don't know, just, oh my god, stop talking, she never stops. Anyway, this voyage requires getting a key to open a chest that has a skull in it, which you then have to bring to a certain island. And all of these things, including the final island, are marked on the map for everyone. And if you get the turn in, you get an easy 50,000 gold, which means you should see competition on this, but for whatever reason, people don't really do it that often. There are two world events that are often confused by newer players, the Fort of Fortune marked by a cracked skull glowing red, and the Fort of the Damned marked by a skull with only red eyes. The Fort of the Damned is a player activated event you can start by lighting all the lanterns in the fort, you get different colors by dying in various ways and getting the flame on your way out of the Fairy of the Damned, or if you're a pirate legend you can use the Skull of Destiny. Afterward, you put that skull or a ritual skull in the center and then the event has officially started. This event contains a lot of valuable loot, so you will definitely have PvP in your future if you choose to activate it. The most valuable chest in the game is called the Chest of Fortune. It gives you a ton of gold and helps you earn some really rare cosmetics and it changes places every season. Okay, I think that's it. I can't imagine anything else you would need to know as a new player. Thank you so much for sticking with me in this video. Again, I'm getting very close to that 100K sub mark, so if you take the time to subscribe, I would super appreciate it, or just come hang out and say what's up in the stream. Regardless, happy sailing, and thank you for watching.